Welcome to the Warrior Bod Pod. I am your host, Coach Kyle, and with me today is Brandon Schultz, an online coach that programs for mentors and other coaches through Prescript, which we will talk about in a bit, as well as anyone wanting to get out of pain, get stronger so they can get the most out of their lives. Brandon, it is, as always, a pleasure to chat with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's nice to, I mean, talk outside of the gym. I completely go. agree with you, my man. And I also want to, I also want to go into a little bit here where I just want to acknowledge something that you have helped me with. Okay. And I got to say like from all the coaches I've met in the last 10 years, cause you've been in the industry seven, correct? Yeah. Uh, I like to learn from coaches as if they are my coaches and a lot of the uh, information, I, I look at you for a lot of awesome anatomy information that is, I trust your opinion on it. And it's like a really cool twist on things. It's like you're doing fun movements or kind of like simple movements. You're getting the biggest bang for your buck, but it's also uh, interesting enough to kind of like want to learn more, but there's so much more benefit to uh, just a regular thing. And I just want to say that I appreciate your uh, coaching. I appreciate how you uh, are an educator and just you're an awesome fellow all around. It's always fantastic to chat with you. Wow, thanks, man. That that's uh, that's really nice. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. So, dude, yeah, no worries. Honestly, more people should say more nice things about you. I know there's a lot of smack talk. Just joking. That's not true. <laughs> Lots of love behind my back, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, obviously, like every superhero has an origin story. So I'm kind of curious about like where were you at before you started coaching? Which, of course, is seven years ago things are blurry in that length of time, but to the best of your ability, like what got you into doing what you're doing now? And we'll eventually talk about that, but let's start with the origin story. Yeah, I was, um, you know, growing up, I could never make up my mind. Like I, I always wanted to do a bunch of shit because I can swear, right? That's cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sick. All right. So yeah, I always wanted to do a bunch of shit because like, I always enjoyed aspects of so many different things. So um, I was actually in university originally to be a psychologist. So I took two years at the University of, of Alberta um, in psychology. And um, at the same time, like I was sort of starting to rediscover my kind of passion for fitness itself. So in high school, before I went to university, um, I had, you know, some back injuries, uh, some hip injuries and things like that. And it sort of kept me out of the gym for a couple years. And then when I was in university, I really started to find that again. So I was going to school for around two years, started picking up the gym again, you know, because I was out of pain. And, and it was really just, um, really just the process of, of uh, sort of going through that myself and helping myself through it, that I felt like I wanted to know more and I wanted to help other people coach or help other people get out of pain and, and live better lives. So Sweet. I was in university, I sort of uh, started going to this gym, uh, Good Life Fitness, for those in Canada, very familiar with that, I'm sure. Um, and sort of how I got started was they, they were doing this, it's called a life changer. So when you're, you know, in the hot box, and they're selling your memberships, um, you're, you know, you're sold on this like extra thing. It's like this, this sort of in depth process, they sell it as like a, you get an assessment, they take you through this this whole long winded thing. And you end up like at the end of it, you end up sort of figuring a little bit more about, you know, how you move and all this stuff. So I did that. The, uh, the manager at the club at the time, um, she, she did the assessment and she tried to sell me on this crazy package of like $13,000. I was like, I'm in university. I can't afford that. So I walked out and she's like, yeah, I'll see you in a month. Like, let's just do a reevaluation and we'll just, we'll just uh, see how it goes. And then, you know, a month later comes around, I had in my schedule, I show up and she was surprised to see me. And um, because these things normally don't, people don't show up for those, those types of things. And I, I later, um, you know, she offered me a job afterwards because I had seen some progress myself. So she was like, she offered me a job. And she's like, if you ever want to be a trainer, just let me know. And you have a job here. So I didn't do that. And for the first little while, I kept with my psychology. Um, and then there was a day where I just sort of was sitting in class. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this. I'm, I don't want to be here for the next 10 years. 
and I want to chase down this sort of passion about fitness. And I know I have something lined up, so I'm going to go pursue that. And now I'm here. I think that's freaking sweet, dude. So it's actually so funny that you mentioned the psychology thing, because if I were not doing what I'm doing right now, I would have absolutely gone down the route of psychology or law. Why the law? I think I like the debate and just like, as long as I don't have a sketchy person, I think it'd be awesome. But uh, how, how much, how much with the combination of going through that bit of psychology, as well as what you're doing for coaching now um, and everything in between, how much uh, psychology or how much uh, of what we do on a day to day, like towards succeeding, how much of it is mind compared to exercise or going to the gym? Because people think, oh, if I want to get fit, it's going to the gym. But I think that there's, uh, it's much better to get to the root, going through the psychology and through the brain, or that's just the, the fastest way to success. So what do you, what do you think with that, like mind body connection, how does mindset impact our overall progress? Yeah, obviously it's a huge part, right? Like if you've ever trained a client or if you've ever even tried to stick to a habit period, like, um, like the mind and like how you perceive yourself and like, and, and the things that you want to do and accomplish like that's going to be a huge part of this. So I think when it comes to, you know, law, like you said, or when it comes to psychology, like I was in, um, I think the thing that translates the most is sort of the nuance of training, right? So like when it comes to, to psychology or like working with people or like matters of the brain and mind, I think that some of those some of those things, it's like, you can't really look at everyone in one with one lens. Right. Mm. And I think that's what I love because every day is kind of like a, a different problem. Right. And as, as weird as it is to say, or I, like, I'm, I'm that person that gets to solve that problem for someone. And that it, it's kind of, it's almost selfish in a way, but it's selfishly helping people. Right. So it's like, I get satisfaction from being able to get people out of pain and solve problems right? Obviously it's a pretty productive selfishness, but, um, that's what I, that's what I think carries the most weight with, with my interest in psychology and fitness itself is that, you know, understanding that everyone that comes to you is going to be a different, different, uh, different case. They're going to have different, um, things that you need to consider when, when programming exercise. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's like the biggest thing. That's pretty sweet. So, I find that something, a common denominator with a lot of folks that pursue some sort of psychology or some sort of, basically psychology, we'll just say psychology. Uh, there's a common denominator of some sort of uh, uh, difficulties that they went through as they were growing up. Now, we don't need to dive into that kind of stuff, but if I'm right about that, let me know. If I'm wrong about that, let me know. But nonetheless, when it comes to um, our BS or belief systems, when it comes to basically the stories we keep on telling ourselves, was there ever a, a story that you kept on telling yourself that was keeping you where you were at going through hardships, the possible hardships and what has gotten you to this point? Because you're a really chill person. Like mo it's, it's pretty sweet. So it's kind of cool, like knowing a bit about your past and it's, it's cool because a hundred people can experience the same past, but you're going to get a hundred different futures. So what are some belief systems that you've overcome for yourself and how do you, how did you do it? What was your biggest tip for someone that would be looking for to basically uncuff themselves from their own self limiting beliefs? I like, I, I would say growing up and like, if I look back at, at my childhood in particular, and I, I, I don't think you're wrong here, by the way. I mean, I've got, I've got plenty of issues, but I think, um, yeah, issues, <laughs> issues. Yeah. <It's, laughs> I think the biggest thing was, you know, as, as counterproductive and this could never be advice for people, but it's like, I, I went through a lot alone. Um, so, you know, I didn't have a dad growing up really. Um, I had a stepdad and, and whatnot, but it was never quite the same as like an actual true father, you know? Mm. Um, and we can get into all my daddy issues if we want, but I think what the biggest thing is like, I had to deal with a lot and it's like, if I had an issue, I didn't feel comfortable going to anyone else because I think, you know, there's some abandonment stuff probably there, mm -hmm. which are all things that I've worked through now. And I don't really, 
I don't really like I'm I'm chill, like you said. Like I don't really have any any necessarily problems, but I think the biggest thing was like going through it alone and figuring out ways to look inside myself and like have that self-awareness or bring that self-awareness into the situation. I think that's the biggest thing is like self-awareness is so hard to teach or whatever, but it's one of those things that when you are forced to do it and to go to no one else but yourself, you kind of, you kind of learn that pretty quick. Right. And I mean, I, you know, I'm fucking, I'm a ginger. I was bullied as a kid. Right. I'm pale. Right. So yeah, I got um, a matching shirt. Right. We got matching shirts. Yeah, Somehow yours... I don't just meld into, it doesn't look like yeah. I'm jobless it's right like now. just a couple of shades difference. Right. I, it's just because I've got a little bit of a burn because it's hot right now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, going, going through that sort of thing, you pick up as a kid, you pick up really quickly what makes people tick or like what is acceptable uh, in this sort of social norm or like, or what different clicks of people expect of you or like the behaviors that you feel like you should have um, going into that. Right. So it's like, you learn pretty, pretty quick about yourself and, and, and about people themselves. Cause it's like, you know, I was constantly looking for, you know, are these people going to react to something that I'm doing that's going to make me get bullied, right? Yeah. So yeah. again, it's terrible advice. Don't go through things alone. Like use the people around you. They love you. And I think people need to hear that. But um, for me, I think that's one of the things that shaped me as a, as a person for sure today. Nice. That's awesome. So going from, uh, you know, dark, deep depths before we get any further. Uh, you, you recently started with Prescript and I think, I think the freaking knowledge bombs that uh, you're, you're dropping with even content or just watching like you or overhearing creeping, I guess, you talking to your client and coaching them through uh, different cues and a whole bunch of different ones. So uh, before we talk about Prescript, I actually want to talk about uh, the first thing that comes to mind where we really connected as a common denominator and that's breathing and breathing is so undervalued it is so underrated it is the is the simplest thing for us to use as a um as a stress reducer it is so good for us from a performance space it's so good for us when it comes to sleeping which I definitely want to get your sleep habits out here. If you're still doing it, I'm not sure if you're still doing the tape across, oh, yeah. but still want to chat with that. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about breathing, man. Like uh, anything, uh, what, uh, why'd you get interested in breathing? Why is breathing so important? What should and could people do today to improve their overall well being with breath? Yeah. Um, yeah. So breathing, right. It's, like when you look at it, like you said, it's, it's something that's so underrated and it's really not sexy. Like breathing is not a sexy thing. Um, and it's like, I think that's why it doesn't get the attention that I think it deserves. But the, the, the thing that interests me about it is just the overarching, like the wide, the wide net that it casts over uh, different aspects of your life, right? Like uh, there's, there's, um, you know, benefits even to your dental health based on how you're breathing, right? There's benefits to how your face develops as you, as you breathe as a, as a kid. Um, and it's like for training now, I think of it as like one, it's really low hanging fruit for a lot of the people like that. Cause like when you look at a gen pop client, which is kind of for the most part, what I train that in coaches but um, when you look at a gen pop client, it's like what we're doing is we are trying to leverage time as much as possible because you see that person two, maybe three times a week, maybe four times a week, right? So you have three hours to make a difference in that person's life every week. So if you're looking at how much, like what kind of bang for your buck you can get, right? With that time, it's like if I can use something that they're already doing on automatic, aka breathing, right? And then if I can make improvements there, um, then outside of the gym, it, those habits will carry over to their real life or to their to their daily life, right? And the thing that, so like that, that, that low hanging fruit thing was big for me, especially. 
Um, I've got, you know, I've, I've had allergies or I've, I have allergies too. Um, breathing through my nose has been a struggle, which is obviously kind of, it's one of those, once you, once you go down this breathing route, breathing through the nose is a pretty crucial, crucial little bit. Um, but I think that's the, that's, that's the most important thing that drew, drew me to it was like the amount of, the amount of time that I can spend on something that's going to produce the most amount of results in people's lives. Right. That's totally fair. So on that note, obviously sleep is also very important. So yeah. I'm just going to dive into the the tape across the mouth for your sleeping. Yeah. So are you still doing that? Yay. Yes. No. Um, so not currently, um, but I'm thinking about starting it up again. Cause I've noticed I've woken up a couple days with a dry mouth, which means that I'm, I'm, I'm mouth breathing throughout the night. Um, cause it's something that I've, I've dealt with for a long time, but, um, not currently, but I will be. So obviously uh, there's a majority of folks that are more like mouth breathers. Yeah. So if they're thinking of going to sleep while putting tape over their mouth, they're not thinking that they're breathing through their nose. They're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to suffocate. So what is the purpose behind the tape and what benefits does it have to your sleep and to your breathing? Yeah. So the, the, the idea behind tape is to sort of force yourself to breathe through your nose. Right now, that doesn't always land with people, right? Especially with someone like me. Like I've I've had a personal experience with it, where like you know I struggle to breathe through my nose to begin with. So if you start to tape your mouth, um, it's it's going to be challenging right off the bat, right? But in terms of the benefits, like we want to be breathing through our nose as as much as possible, especially overnight, because if you think about how many hours we're getting, whatever six to eight hours or seven and a half hours, how whatever sort of sleep um, information you want to want, want to follow. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a long time. And if you're breathing through your mouth, that's going to cause problems down the road. So the biggest thing with nasal breathing and the importance of it, or the, the, I guess the drawbacks to mouth breathing are going to be essentially, it's like air is cold, right? The air, whether like, regardless of the temperature outside, the air is cold relative to your insides. So Number one thing is like, if you're taking in all this cold air, a lot of the time, what we see is one, it dehydrates the shit out of you. Mm. So you actually end up losing a lot of water just through mouth breathing. Um, and then which if you're involved in sport or just general life, regardless of what, like hydration is such an important factor for healthy tissue in general. Um, but the other thing it does is like, it can, you know, aggravate the upper airways too, like your throat or, um, you know, that upper, upper, yeah, the upper, the upper airways, right? So yeah. people with like asthma and whatnot, like if you're taking in all this cold air and it's dehydrating you and it's drying you out, um, you know, you're probably going to be more prone to getting those, um, those uh, asthma attacks, right? That they call it. Gotcha. Right? The other thing is like, um, being able to breathe through your nose will um, help slow down your breathing, right? That's the that's another important thing because the mm. slower your breath is, right, the more sort of parasympathetic you can get. Okay. Totally, because then we're actually regulating our stress or stressors basically through yeah, breath. It, exactly. So like our heart rate is tied to our breathing. Okay. So um, as you inhale, like that fresh oxygenated air is getting into our system. So our heart rate naturally speeds up, mm -hmm. right? To make use and to, to diffuse all of that oxygen out of the air, right? And then as we exhale, right, our heart rate starts to slow down because that air is no longer in our lungs and there's no more real value to it, right? So gotcha. it's not like we, it's not like now its job is to be circulated through the system. It's not necessarily to be brought into the system. So if we can you know, find ways to slow our breathing down, especially extending the exhales rather than, or in, extending the exhales in relation to the inhalation, right? We're mm -hmm. going to be naturally telling our body that we're in a safe space and we're able to calm down a little bit. Nice. Right? And before, well, before you sleep, that's extremely important, right? Most people don't sleep because, you know, they're wired and they're thinking about mm -hmm. things too much anxiety. That's totally fair. I was listening to, uh, and I, I try this while I'm walking too. So I like to do like a walking, like breathing kind of thing. And this just kind of, it mellows me out quite a bit. Yeah. And um, there's one that I was watching with Andrew Huberman on the Huberman lab. And he was talking about like the quick inhale, like a double inhale where it's a, 
and like a super chill kind of like, so it's a quick, like two second kind of inhale, but a nice, like six to eight second exhale. So that's kind of like what you're talking about, right? Where you're coming down the yeah. parasympathetic system. hundred percent. Yeah. So, so what do you, so do you think someone like that, that's like really amped up, that's really stressed out just by having that kind of intentional breathing practice, it'll help them basically in like handle more stress, like their stress resiliency will increase based off of breath. For sure. I mean, and, and again, to some extent, right? Like Mm -hmm. people, I think it's a strategy that people need, right. Mm -hmm. Um, they need to have like to be able to get, and I think this is like, we can get into some cold exposure stuff too, but I think this is a lot of the science behind, uh, or the simplified pared down science behind cold exposure is like Mm -hmm. exposing yourself to levels of, or that high level of cold. Like if you're going through an ice bath or something like that, Mm -hmm. right. If you think about what that does to your body and what kind of sympathetic state that it puts you into, Mm -hmm. right. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, What's the first thing you do when, if you have a cold shower, you jump into a cold water, right? Like you, yeah. Like you can't breathe. Right. So if you can get into that sympathetic state or that sympathetic environment, but teach yourself to come down from that and be able to slow down your exhale, I think that's sort of like, that's sort of how we need to think about um, life in general, because, you know, Karen from accounting, she's stressed up and wired her entire life where her boss comes in and, um, you know, rings her out or whatever for doing something that she shouldn't have been doing, or she's just not having, you know, high quality work, Mm -hmm. whatever the case is, it's like that puts you in a pretty shitty position or pretty state of mind. So like to be able to sort of roll with the punches, I guess you could say, um, and like bring yourself down and like not let it affect you as much or not let it affect your mental state. I think that's where it's really important. And that can be extended to sleep or performance or whatever. That's pretty sweet. There's a, I'm not actually sure if I told you this one before, but there was a tough mutter I did a couple of years back and there was this lady Claire and she basically spends most, she works in the ice caps, like North pole, South pole, like she's in the Antarctic. She's probably the only person that I know that has had Antarctica as an office. <laughs> right it's crazy but we were doing a tough mutter and during the tough mutter they have a cold exposure part they call it an arctic enema it's like really cold when they have the ice cubes and they're like exactly what you described it's like <gasps> it takes your breath away yeah it it like and it sucks it feels like it literally feels like someone's punching you in the gut yeah and it's so funny like this is how i'm describing it but it's that it's it's not as bad it's like a short-term discomfort but yeah. she actually said, because it was a part of the train, like there's a possibility you're going to fall off the boat into Arctic waters. What do yeah. you do? And so I was curious. I was like, what do you do? And she said that you have to force yourself <gasps> to get that quick, that, that first inhale. Yeah. Cause once you get past that first inhale, then it's a little bit more mellow. It's like, okay, now you can actually breathe. But when we get into that shock, we have to we have to calm our reaction down. Otherwise we're just going to freeze and we're just going to end up in a bad situation. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool that you're saying that. So yeah, let's talk about prescript as well, because when you're describing prescript and some of the, some of the stuff that you have coming up too, definitely want to talk about that, but yeah, let's hear about prescript. Let's hear about uh, what you're doing with them. Let's talk about how you're coaching clients and stuff. For sure. Okay. We'll, we'll start with the prescript stuff. So like, um, you know, Prescript is this company that's, you know, they've really, they've really started to be become popular over the last probably three years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they are is like, they're a trainer, they, they're a trainer education platform, right? Like they have coaches, including myself that, that do um, put that put on courses to for the betterment of other coaches, right? So, you know, our goal is to get to train the trainer essentially. All right. But the beautiful thing about Prescript is that it's not just an education platform. It's also a community too. Mm -hmm. So it's like some of the people that have come through, you know, sort of the system and like gone through some of the courses and whatnot, they all stick around. And we have this, um, we have this discord server, right. And so many of us, at least the common, the the people who really stick with the, with the, the knowledge and stick with the, the tools and stuff that we give them, right? We all are able to collectively bring our experience together and sort of have this discussion and 
then apply it to our own personal training businesses too, or coaching business or whatever the case is. Right. So I think as a, as a coach, as a, as a trainer, they're extremely valuable. Um, but even just as a general lifter too, like we've got people who are plumbers or people who are electricians or whatever, who come through and just, they just love fitness and they just want to learn more about it. And um, it's kind of a, yeah, kind of one of the best ways to sort of get, dip, dip your toes into it, right? That's pretty sweet. Something I've noticed, because after you started working with Prescript, I was, I just followed them as well to yeah. see what they're all about. Seemed like a bunch of like good vibes as well. Like I really, I really like watching uh, the stuff that's being posted and it's really like, a, it's, it's just bare bones. That's what I've really recognized about it is like, it's really bare bones. It's not flashy. Yeah. It, there's not really any wrapping paper. It's just, this is what it is. This is what you get. This is the movements. And it, and it's based off of, there's no, it, it doesn't seem to have any dogma attached to it, yeah. which I really like to it because it, then it actually carries over to multiple different realms rather than if you're like, let's say uh, a, a keto person, then you only speak about keto and how it's the best thing since sliced bread, which you can't have on keto. <laughs> right. So I, yeah. I really like that. There's no dogma. It's just like facts-based science-based, like educational. And I think that's really cool. I think that's like a super, super cool thing where it's kind of lacking where people are going for flashy, flashy. It's yeah. really like grounded. Yeah. So, so like that, that's pretty sweet. So like what I've like, I've taken a lot of different certifications. I've taken around 30 different certifications. Plus, I don't even know how many. I've lost count at this point. Um, but what Prescript does and, and the beauty of it, like you said, it's really simple. Um, and what they do is they don't teach you a system. Like that's the thing is like they give you the knowledge and they give you the, the first principles right around it. So they'll teach you the basics of lifting and like what's happening from an anatomical perspective, right? But they're not trying to give you the answers to everything. They want you to sort of use the knowledge that you gain and evaluate some of the, the purveying, you know, like you said, dogma in this industry and like look at it from a different perspective, right? What they're doing is they're giving you a filter set, right? They're giving you a filter set to, to essentially look at some of the courses that you've taken or some of the things that you see online and you can be like, all right, not valuable, valuable, not valuable, valuable, valuable. And you can basically create, you know, this system yourself, right? Of, of, cause it's, it's, yeah, I like it. It's, it's principles based. It's not systems based. They say it's like a systems way of thinking, right? So it's not that, cause like systems break down, right? Mm -hmm. Sy systems will always break down because you're going to you're going to have that one person that comes to you and you're like all right well i've gone a to b um c doesn't actually work so now what now what do i do right so so many certifications now they try and teach you this revolutionary system that's tr that tries to apply to everyone mm -hmm. and it's like you can't apply it to everyone right that brings us back to that whole nuance thing that i was talking about in the beginning of this whole podcast was like nuance is everything without nuance or, or context it's like we kind of have nothing right because if none of this stuff matters if the person that you're coaching it like if it doesn't apply to that person that's right? totally fair yeah that's pretty sweet so this is kind of kind of a point on that one which ties into a uh, one of my favorite topics which something i wish was taught in school and uh it i I, I learned it from philosophy yeah, and I believe that you're on the same realm as that one, but how important, and I find it very important, but how important is critical thinking? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot, I find that um, with how quickly we get information, how quickly we really just get things period, like we get things fast yeah. and people are looking for more of a done for you approach rather than a done with you approach. How important is critical thinking to just all aspects? So there's not really a particular context I'm thinking of here, yeah. just more. So what are your thoughts on critical thinking and how can it help others and any tips on that one? Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I think critical thinking is incredibly important, right? Um, and it's important because sort of what I was saying before, it's like life doesn't live or we don't live in a vacuum, 
right? So it's like not everything is going to go through this, you know, microwave manual style of, mm. of thinking. It's like you can't really look at humans as complex as we are and like just use one approach for everyone. Um, the problem with a lot of this stuff and, and education in general and even, even some of the, the trainer specific education is that, like you said, we're trying to essentially get everything sort of handed to you or give, give us the systems, right? Give, give it to me so that I, I know what to do, right? And if I think back to my time in, um, you know, university, that's kind, of what, that's kind of all it is, right? You don't really get a say, right? You show up to class, this is how it is, this is what's going to be on the test, know this. And it's really tough to go from that sort of environment to um, this environment where, you know, everything matters until it doesn't, mm. right? So it's like critical thinking is going to give you the tools that you need to think outside of, um, outside of like that, that 1% of people that things apply to, right? Because you're going to run into stuff as a coach where it's like, oh, I've used this with someone else. I can, I'll, I'll try this with them. And that's great. And if it works, that's awesome. But it's like, what happens if that doesn't work for that person? It's like, you need to be able to, to think for yourself and not be like, oh, wait, hold on, Susie. Uh, just like sit there. I'm going to Google this. And then we'll get back to our session and figure out what to do from here. It's like, uh, you know, or like, let's say, for instance, which happens, I'm sure all the time to you as well. It's like, we're going through that hour session with a client and a machine's taken. Mm, it's yeah. like, well, uh, let's, you know, maybe we'll circle back around. Um, and sometimes again, sometimes that works, but sometimes it doesn't. And you need to think, all right, well, what am I, what am I going to do with this person to maximize that the time that we have together to like, that's going to be like the leg press that's being taken by this one dude yeah. that, you know, we can also do like, that's a pretty simple example, but you know, it's, it's so applicable to our lives as coaches. Yeah, you want to make sure that you're actually thinking, what can I do in the meantime, rather than waiting there for 15 minutes until the fella, just like watching, you know? Yeah. It's like, no, so how funny. many sets do you have? Five? Okay, yeah, we'll just be here. We'll be waiting for you. It's like, no. Totally. I really like the idea of, because uh, uh, we're always concerned, like our brains always want to work in binary, like right and wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. And so we always, we seem to forget this is just an observation is we seem to forget that we're actually contrarian just as is. So there are times for forgiveness and there are times for violence. There's times for forgiveness where someone's wronged you and you decide to forgive them despite what they did, because you just don't want to live with it. And then there's violence where if someone's attacking your significant other, things are going to get violent real quick, you know? Yeah. And I think critical thinking is having the wisdom to tell which one's appropriate to use at what time. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And I think that's like super important. Um, so what, yeah, you, we were chatting about it before, but you said a lot of continuing education. I feel like you're a professional student. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and I think life in itself is just one big lesson. Like there's a, there's always going to be, we're either going to be propelling forward by learning from our mistakes or learning from others. And I think that there's a, a solid chunk of people that are either going to uh, perpetuate pain by not learning how to get out of it, or they're just going to feel stagnant and just find comfort in the stagnancy. So I guess you're, I, I look at you as a student of life, just like someone who's a curious, intuitive person. So what the education was that you've had is not as important as the question of, how important is it for you to learn if you're just consistently doing so many different certifications? Cause I've seen a couple of studies where it was, and don't quote, I'm probably going to get it wrong. If I'm wrong, then it's all good. But there's a lot of research having to do with Alzheimer's and dementia, where if we actually like Sudoku, Sudoku yeah. has been shown to help uh, folks like counter dementia and Alzheimer's to the best of the ability. Obviously, if there's a genetic predisposition to something, then it's going to happen. But even though we know it may happen, doesn't mean we can't work towards prevention, right? We don't have to wait until something becomes shitty to deal with it in advance. For sure. I think too many folks wait until it's shitty, but do you think, do you think that there is a connection between living a fulfilling life and the pursuit of knowledge? 
Oh, I'm getting existential here. I love it. Yeah, buddy. I wanted so, to have I wanted to have a nice little intro where it was like we're talking about coaching and stuff, and then just put it. Let's let us let us just like freaking take out the cannon, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. I I think to a certain extent there is, but I think there has to be a point where we not stop learning, but regulate our learning. I think because. For someone who's taken so many different courses, I'm not really looking to take on a ton of courses anymore, right? And partly because the state of the education that I've that I've taken again mm -hmm. is, um, you know, it's it's not it's not the best, right? Because again, I was talking about like the systems, and that's so many of the different certifications you can take now. Is like this is point A, point B. There's no really there, there's only one way that they want to teach you, um, and they don't really have leave room for critical thinking. But when I say regulate your learning, I think um, I'd rather go deep than go wide, right? So like if you're you'd spending- You'd rather be like, instead of being four feet deep in the water, you'd rather go for like the Marianas Trench. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like I've taken 30 different courses, so I've got a wide knowledge on a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? But that knowledge doesn't go very deep. So I've learned that- you know, the way that I went about things as an, or as a coach in the early times of my career was that I wish that I didn't spend so much time looking for the new thing, but spending more time on the things that I was learning. Right. So, so yeah, like if, nice. you're, if you're constantly going from certification to certification to certification, it's like, you don't have any room to apply the stuff that you're actually learning. You're just trying to learn new stuff looking for that new thing that might help you but it's like i would have rather taken half or a quarter of the certifications that i did take but spend time learning what's valuable about those things and extending that over a little bit over a period of time right nice so more so like the pursuit of mastery in one thing and to some extent right like as coaches we kind of need to be a swiss army knife to some extent but it's like i think doubling down on on the things that you are interested in and the things that have the most applicability to your clients too right like i think at, at, at some point the the lifelong learner thing um while i think we should be um you know constantly trying to learn new things or expand our horizons or or look at the way that we think about the world i think that's extremely important for lifelong health and longevity and like you know in order to just stay same throughout our lives right but when it comes to career specific learning it's like there has to be a certain point where we kind of s slow down the learning that we are doing and spend time with what we have learned because there's really not much new that's coming out that we can really talk about when it comes to biomechanics or like anatomy and physiology all these things right of course there's going to be research of course there's going to be new things that people are trying to to look into especially on the nutrition front but like when it comes to most things it's like is this one random study really gonna actually make its way into the weight room with my clients probably not right oh that's totally fair yeah i really like that i have this uh one of my role models is a uh, morimoto musashi he's a japanese samurai a mar or sword fighter he was the greatest swordsman in existence mm -hmm. and something I really like because through, through activities, we can find self mastery as well, because when we're trying to better ourselves, we're, we're still overcoming our own belief systems and our own perceived uh, stories or our perceived reality, right? Yeah. Our, our personality is a result of our personal reality or kind of like either direction on that one. But anyways, uh, I really love the, the pursuit of just maybe not just one thing, but I yeah. love the pursuit of mastery and the just getting things dialed in. Like what Bruce Lee says, he's like, he's not scared of the person that can, that knows a thousand punches or a thousand kicks. Yeah. He's scared of the person that practiced one kick a thousand times. Yeah. And I, I think the, that I think pursuing, pursuing self mastery is in my mind, uh, one of my parts of definition as a definition of success. My definition of success is the pursuit of self-mastery and um, 
contributing to the human race. Yeah. Super, super simple. But I, I think, yeah, I just like how you're like a sponge. You're just absorbing things so much. And in that way, you are mastering the self as well. So on the note of mastering the self, let's, let's talk about like client struggles and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, are there any struggles that you've seen that's fairly consistent that some folks that are listening may be struggling with right now? And what would be either from your personal experience or uh, working with clients, where is a good starting point for them to overcome it? And it could be anything in particular, just what you witnessed the most and what you've helped uh, your clients overcome as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's not like everyone has different, everyone's going to have different struggles. Like you said, like there's not going to be one specific thing. Um, I think the thing that people struggle with the most is the idea that, um, you know, training needs to be this short-term means to a goal, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like people see training and exercise as this like, oh, I just want to lose, you know, 50 pounds and then I'll be good and I'll be happy. And it's like, you will, you know, you can lose that 50 pounds and that's awesome. That's great. Great for you. Um, I can help you get there, but like what happens after that 50 pounds? It's like, what, you're just going to stop? Like, I think that the thing that gets people tripped up the most, and it's like, maybe this is me putting a problem onto people potentially, right? Where it's like, I see it as a problem. They might not. But um, I think I think that's the thing that I, I see as a problem that most people come to you as, as like as a trainer, right? They all come to you with some idea of what they want to achieve. And I have my own idea of what I want them to achieve, right? It's, so it's funny that you say that. I also have goals for my clients. Yeah. I actually think, sorry to interrupt you on this one. But no, no, it's fine. I think one of the things that is really difficult, and I just realized this today, so it's kind of cool that we're chatting about it now, but something, and this is just in my experience, if you have a thought on it, let me know. Cause I think it's kind of a cool, uh, it's kind of a cool point of view that a lot of clients probably don't see. And the biggest struggle that I have when it comes to clients is when you're able to see as a coach, you're looking from your experience, your education, what you've been through personally, and you're seeing your client that's there could be a first time session. It could be a consultation. It could be just ch chatting over uh, some sort of a DM or from whatever social media platform. But I think the hardest thing for me personally is being able to see the potential and believing in the person so much, but them not believing in themselves the same way. And that's like, it's totally like, it makes complete sense because they're going through something that's really difficult, but it's tough when it's tough when the goals of a client become more important to me than to them, but also seeing what they're completely capable of and how much they can really reach. And that's, that's, that's the toughest thing for me as a trainer to see is when they're just like so close to just that shift yeah. and they just don't get it. Yeah. And I, I what my like my solution to that has always been to change the metric mm, nice right again it's not going to fix everything right like you you can't have everyone in the same same net as well right but i think um changing that metric from like okay you want to lose 50 pounds um that's a very short term you know short term goal i mean it takes a long time to lose 50, 50 pounds or it can take a long time to lose 50 pounds but like um if we then change that to, all right, let's try and get really strong and get out of pain, right? You're essentially, if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is strength, you're essentially providing that person a lifelong pathway because they're never going to be like, they're never going to be like, oh, well, I'm strong enough. That's, that's okay. I can, I can walk away now, right? It's like the stronger you get, kind of like the better you feel about yourself and like, oh, next time I can lift a little bit more or next time I can lift a little bit more and get stronger, or like next six months from now, if I test, like I'm going to be able to lift more weight. And it's like changing the, changing their goal, whether they know it or not from like losing 50 pounds to, you know, putting 50 pounds on the bar and lifting that it's like the weight loss is going to come with it. 
it's just a matter of like altering their perception of their own their own goals and how they got there right in the meantime yes we're we're going to work on the on the weight loss we're going to work on you know the nutrition stuff and the habits that are going to make you successful long term um those habits that make you successful long term are the same things that you should be sticking with after you've lost the the, the 50 pounds right so have that lifelong pursuit of all right, I don't need to lift weight or I don't need to uh, lose weight now. All I want to do is just get strong and, you know, be able to keep up with my kids when I'm, when I'm older. Right. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. I like the, uh, one that I've been playing around with for myself, mm -hmm. uh, is what do I want to be capable of at the age of 100? If I make it there? Yeah. I think that's a, it's, that's been really helpful for me because we're either running away from pain or towards pleasure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I don't want to be like bedridden, which a hundred is going to be a pretty tough one, but for the, for the most part, I don't want to be bedridden. I want to be able to be active and live a fulfilling life that way. Yeah. But yeah, man. So, uh, tell, tell me a little bit about, um, some programs, some events that you got coming up. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for the most part, like I'm sort of in a, in a constant state of like taking on clients. Um, I own my own personal training business, um, focusing more on the online stuff, not really as much in person, um, but it's atomicperformance.ca. That's sort of like my, my platform that I'm starting to build. Um, there's things in the pipeline that are coming out that aren't quite ready to share yet, but the big things that are coming stay out tuned. right now, pardon me, yeah, yeah, stay exactly, tuned. stay tuned. Um, the things that are, are coming up are like, again, taking on clients, but also some of the in-person seminars that we're doing. Um, so I'm going to BC, uh, on September 8th, I think. So we got September 10th and 11th in BC with Prescript. Uh, we're teaching an upper body intensive. So two days of just solid training principles and, uh, ap apl our application, right. Of that theory right on the spot. So, really taking this idea of like, yeah, we're going to learn some stuff, but we're also going to learn to do some stuff. Right. So that, and then the following weekend right here in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, uh, the 17th and 18th, I think it is. And we're going to be over at the vault, um, gym in Edmonton. We're doing a lower body intensive. So, um, all the people from the prescript crew or, or the main people from the prescript crew, we're all going to be there. Um, yeah, come hang out, have a good time. Sweet. So if anyone wanted to reach you, where would they find you? Uh, Instagram. That's, that's basically it. That's my platform. What's your, um, uh, what's your Instagram handle, my man? Yeah. It's at Brandon, Brandon dot Schultz. S C H U L T Z E. Nice. Yeah. You can slide uh, in the DMS. Anyone, <laughs> anyone, <laughs> any day, 3 a.m. <laughs> preferred. <laughs> yeah. So we're at the top of the hour. I don't want to take up too much time because I know you have a client soon. So honestly, just got a question for you. Yeah. If you were to go back in time or if you're looking at your, let's say you're 80 years old and you're looking back at you right now, yeah. what is the number one piece of advice that your 80 year old self would give you? Just, just start and do the fucking thing. Like I, I'd say that's the biggest thing is like, I can get in my head because of probably because of my childhood right? Because I've always been hyper aware of, of what, how people, how people perceive me or like how people will perceive the, the actions that I take in this world. And it's like, there's nothing that you can, that you can do that like realistically is going to get any more perfect by waiting. So like just start now and just fucking see what happens. Nice. Would you say that's your message for the world too? Honestly, yeah. I mean, I've I've struggled with it. I still struggle with it to this day. So it's like when I'm 80, I better fucking get it figured out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, living with regrets, one of my biggest, uh, biggest things. Cause we're all gonna end up on a bed at some point, right? So it's like, mm. yeah, life's too Business. short for regrets. Just fucking do it. Totally fair, my man. So yeah, other than that, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for being on this. It's top of the hour. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So uh yeah. Other than that, I hope you have an awesome day, dude. Uh, for everyone listening, hope you also have an awesome day. I hope your day treats you as good as you look. And as always, whatever platform you're listening to, be sure to like, subscribe, comment below with your favorite takeaway. And until next time, I hope your day treats you as good as you look. See ya.